Well, let's get into um, <clears throat> the passage again this evening. We're going to look again at that second section, but again, I'm not quite sure what I, what I uh, asked the, um, the folks up in, up upstairs to display, but if you could do again the same text we were looking at this morning, beginning in verse 19, and then we'll read to the end of the chapter through verse 34. So Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body be, will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow, that they, they do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this evening. Now, again, this morning we saw Jesus calling us to store up our treasures in heaven and not on the earth, um, to spend our time pursuing the honor and the blessing that God has to give rather than the wealth and the honor that the world has to offer. And remember that Jesus gave us three reasons why we should do this. The first one is because the things of this world are, are transient. We can only have them for a short time at best. Uh, as we saw eventually, we're going to lose them. They're either going to be taken from us or they're going to decay, or we're just going to have to give them all up when we leave this world. But the treasures that we have to enjoy in heaven are actually eternal, not only being in the presence of God in a perfect world, but the rewards that he has to give us, which basically include the honors that he has to bestow, and the ability to enjoy heaven even more, which is really far more valuable than, than any uh, things that we find valuable or precious uh, in this world. So those are the things we get to keep forever. These things we don't get to keep. Secondly, he says we should seek to put our treasures in heaven because our hearts are going to draw us where our treasure is. If our treasure is in this world, then we're going to continue to be drawn into the world. But if our treasure is in heaven, then our hearts will continually move us in that direction. And that's the direction, of course, we need to be going. But third, Jesus said, because if our hearts are actually drawing us into the world rather than directing us into heaven, it shows that we have a very serious spiritual problem. Jesus says, our eyes are diseased. Our bodies are full of darkness. We're serving the wrong master. We need to turn. We need to be converted. We need to run to the Lord Jesus Christ for his mercy and his grace. But Jesus goes on now to talk about what we might face next if this isn't our problem, at least the problem of having our treasures here on earth. 
What if we are willing to leave off the riches of the world in order to pursue the riches above? Well, if we had turned our attention, as I said before, from storing up wealth in this world that we might store it up in heaven, we're going to be faced with another difficulty, another problem, and that is how are we going to find what we need? How are we going to provide for ourselves? How are we going to overcome the anxiety that this can cause? Where our next meal is going to come from? Where we're going to find the shelter that we need? That's what Jesus is addressing next by telling us that if we will put God's concerns first, he will take care of those needs. Now, Jesus basically is arguing or he's proving to us through a series of arguments that that is exactly what the Father will do for us. Uh, he gives us really four arguments, an argument based upon what God has already given to us, an argument from his care for the birds, an argument from the fact that worry isn't really going to change anything, it can't do anything for us, and a fourth argument from the clothing, his clothing of the lilies. So let's take a look at each of these four arguments that Jesus uses to enforce what it is he's saying. Now, first of all, Jesus argues from what God has already given us. And I want us to notice first that what, what it is that Jesus is telling us here that the Father is going to provide. Uh, what he is going to provide is food and clothing, what we need, the basics to sustain our lives, what we might call the essentials, that without which we can't live. Now, if we have these things, uh, the Bible says, Jesus tells us uh, that we have everything we actually need. Um, let me just read to you a passage from 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, where Paul essentially tells this to Timothy. He says, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. By the way, notice Paul here is addressing exactly the same thing that Jesus is addressing in the Sermon on the Mount. We don't need really anything more than food and clothing, and the desire for the things of the world to have wealth can plunge us into ruin. We need to be on our guard against it. Now think about when Jesus was, was ministering, when he was walking up and down Palestine, ministering the gospel. What did he have? Essentially, he had the clothes on his back and the little bit of money the disciples were carrying with them, and I think Judas was the one who was actually carrying the bag and he probably pilfered most of what was in it. But that money was either to minister to the poor, as we saw last Lord's Day, or it was to buy the food that they needed. Now, their situation could have been much more comfortable than that, but they really had everything they needed with those basic things. They had everything they needed to do what it is that they needed to do. Now, I don't think Jesus is necessarily calling us to live that austere of, of a lifestyle. He's simply telling us that that's really all we need in order to live. And the Father will make sure that he will provide it for us. And by the way, as we read in our meditation this evening, uh, he'll not only provide that, but he'll provide abundantly beyond all we can ask or think. Now, Jesus proves that his Father will provide these things through two different types of arguments that he uses here. Arguments from the greater to the lesser, uh, which basically go like this. If he's going to do something greater for us, then how much more will he do that which is less? One of greater importance, he'll do the lesser importance. This is the kind of argument that Paul uses in Romans 5 when uh, he wants to assure us that that the Lord is going to keep us once he saved us. He says, if while we were God's enemies, he sent his son to save us, how much more having 
saved us, will he keep us in his grace? If he's willing to do the greater, make the greater sacrifice, give his son while we're enemies, how much more will he keep us now that we belong to him? The other kind of argument he uses is from the lesser to the greater, uh, interestingly. If, if the father is willing to take care of his creatures, which are far less important than we are, if he's faithful to do that, how much more will he take care of us if we are that much more important to him? So these are the arguments. Now, his first argument is from the greater to the lesser, although it may not appear that way on the surface. Jesus says in verse 25, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, how do those two things fit together? When Jesus is asking this question, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing, is he simply saying here, that, you know, there's more to life than food and clothing. Is that, that's sometimes how we hear this explained. Now, it's true that there is more to life than food and clothing, but it's also true that we can't live without food and clothing. So I don't think Jesus actually is, is saying that. I mean, he's telling us we need these things. What he more likely means is this, is that isn't the life that God gave us greater than food? Isn't the body he gave us greater than clothing? And his point would basically be this. If God gives us the greater, if he gives us life, then how much more will he give us what's necessary to sustain that life, which is the, basically the, the food that we need? And if he gave us the greater, a, a body, how much more will he give us the lesser, what's necessary to protect the body, which is our clothing. Now, his implied answer, of course, is much more, and he goes on, of course, to, to prove that, which is why Jesus tells us if God has given us these things, if he's given us a life, if he's given us a body, then he's going to provide the things that we need. He says in verse 25 again, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. If God gave you the one, he will also give you the other. We don't need to worry about it. We don't need to be anxious. The Father will provide. Now, he draws his second argument from God's providential care, uh, really of his, of his creatures, but particularly those less important creatures, uh, the birds. Jesus says in verse 26, look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Now here's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If the Father provides for the birds, which are insignificant and somewhat worthless, how much more will he care for us? Jesus says, are you not worth much more than they? Well, the implied answer, of course, is yes. We are worth much more to him than they are. Now, Jesus used a similar argument when he sent his disciples out to evangelize to assure them that the heavenly Father would protect them. He says in Matthew 10, verses 29 through 31, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Remember, sparrows were used for the, the, the poorest of individuals to buy a sacrificial animals are not two of them sold for a cent. They're essentially worthless. And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, apart from his will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. If God has concern even for the sparrows, Jesus says he will have concern for you. Now, the father cares even for fallen man. I mean, he provides, as Jesus says, uh, his rain and his son. Uh, he provides good gifts to all his creation to take care of them. Uh, he provides for man, we might say, perhaps even more than his other creatures, perhaps because man is still the image of God. But if he is providing even for fallen man, 
how much more is he going to care for us since we have been recreated in his image, since we are in union with his son, since we are clothed with Christ and have been adopted into his family. God cares even for the sparrows. He cares even for fallen man, but he particularly cares for his children. And he's made many promises that he is going to take care of us. And notice also how Jesus says that God provides for the birds because I think there is some parallel between the way he provides for them and the way that he's telling his disciples that he's going to provide for them and maybe sometimes the way he provides for us. The birds don't sow. Now, they don't go out and plant crops and wait for those things to grow, water them and so forth. They don't reap and gather into barns, Jesus says. They don't harvest. They don't have storehouses where they store up things. Birds basically just live day to day. They live on what they can find. But the point is they find what they need because the Father provides for them. Uh, the Father often provides for them by directing them to harvest part of the crops that we're growing. As uh, Dick often points out when he's harvesting cherries, the Lord is providing for the birds, you know, as they eat uh, the cherries that are uh, growing at kind of the upper part of the, of the tree. Sometimes the Lord will provide for us by, by feeding us day by day, even as he does the birds. Uh, think about George Mueller. Remember, we, we saw the documentary on him during the, one of the Reformation series, how the Lord took care of George Mueller. Uh, when he started off, you know, George Mueller didn't, didn't ask people for anything. He just basically made his needs known, and God was providing. And their storehouse was full, and every day the orphans had everything they need. But eventually, the storehouses were empty, and they had absolutely nothing. And sometimes the orphans would, would basically be, be sat at the table and would have nothing in front of them. And yet George Mueller believed that God was going to provide for them, and God provided every time. There was one time when, I guess, there was one bread wagon, they had extra bread, and they said, can you use this? Well, of course, and it fed them on that day. Another day, a milk truck broke down, and, and they, it was near the orphanage, and so he went to the door and said, can you use this milk? Well, yes, we can use it. And the Lord took care of them. This, this is essentially how George Mueller wanted the Lord to, to provide, as Jesus is speaking of here. He determined from the beginning of his ministry that he was going to trust the Lord for everything and he was not going to ask man for anything and God never let him or the orphans down and the orphanage grew and he was taking care of thousands of orphans, basically raising these orphans, teaching them the gospel and many of them were converted. So the Lord will provide and sometimes he provides on a day-by-day -day basis just like he does for the birds. They go out every day to gather their food and they find it because the Lord is providing. Now, Jesus draws his third argument from the fact that our anxiety, all the worry that we might muster, is really not going to change anything, particularly with regard to the length of our lives. He continues in verse 27, And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? I think that's a, a relevant question, don't you? Because... I think oftentimes we find ourselves worrying over the things that we need to sustain us and to take care of us and so forth. And sometimes we, we, we tend to think that worrying is somehow going to change things. We must think that because we keep doing it whenever we find ourselves in need. But here again, Jesus is giving us an argument from the lesser to the greater. And what he's saying is if we can't change even a little thing by worrying, such as adding even an extra hour to our lives, then how is it going to help us to extend our lives for a longer period of time, which is essentially what we're after. We want to live longer. We don't want to die because of a lack of something. Worry isn't going to help us. As a matter of fact, worry is only going to hurt us. It's not going to increase our life. Uh, we know from, from science and I think we know from our own experience that worry actually shortens our lives rather than lengthening them. Worry can certainly hurt our service to the Lord because we're so consumed with our needs that we, we don't actually go out and do what it is that the Lord calls us to do because we're too focused on the things that the Lord tells us not to worry about. And, of course, whenever we worry, it, it also is dishonoring to our Father 
who is faithful. Because it shows one of two things, either that we really don't believe him, we think somehow he's deceiving us, he's lying to us, or believing that he's able to do this, we don't trust that he actually will do these things for us. I mean, those are the only two reasons why we can worry if we believe that what God says here is actually true. Jesus says we don't need to worry. Now, again, sometimes we get so used to worrying about the uncertainties of life that we don't feel normal unless we're worrying. Well, Jesus tells us that peace needs to be the normal for us, the peace that comes from resting in the promises of a heavenly Father who actually loves us and who will take care of us. Now, Jesus draws his fourth argument again from his Father's providence by pointing to the lilies. He says, what about clothing? What about this second essential thing we need for life? Will the Father provide this as well? Jesus says in verses 28 through 30, and why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Now again, here's another argument from the lesser to the greater. If God clothes the lilies of the field, which he likens to grass, grass which quickly withers and then is basically used as fuel for somebody's fire, if he clothes the lilies in such a way that even Solomon with all of his glory and all the wealth that God gave to him wasn't able to clothe himself, and if like the birds these lilies don't have to work for these things, they don't have to spin thread, they don't have to weave cloth, and yet God clothes them, how much more will he clothe us, those whom he loves, again, those whom he's redeemed, those who are part of his own family. Jesus says he will do so much more than the lilies. Jesus tells us that we need to stop doubting. He says, oh, you of little faith, having, you know, little faith is is a problem. We need to become strong in faith. We need to trust the Lord. And again, if we don't get past these fears, if we don't get past these anxieties and rest in the Lord, trust the Lord to provide, really, there's not much we're going to be able to do in the kingdom of heaven because there's always something that maybe stands in the way, something that is threatening, something that the only way we're going to be able to overcome is by trusting Him. And the fact is, whenever we do trust him and we move forward, the Lord never lets us down. He always follows through. He always does exactly what he said he would. You know, um, I think we were singing in a hymn this morning. I don't have the words in front of me, but it talked about the faith that Jesus had. You know, Jesus lived by faith as well. He lived fully as a, as a man in, in the same kind of circumstances that we would live and he had to face all kinds of difficulties in his life. The, the, the question of where the food's going to come from, where the clothing's going to come from, whether his enemies are going to kill him or not. But yet he walked with absolute confidence and trust in his father that all he had to think about was doing what the father called him to do. And he left everything else in his father's hands. He didn't, he didn't worry about it. Uh, Jonathan Edwards actually uh, formulated a um, resolution uh, based upon that, he said that in every circumstance I will do what I believe is my duty from, from the scriptures. And I won't worry about what might happen if I do it. He says, I'm going to do my duty and I'm going to leave everything else in the Lord's hands. God will take care of, of the rest. And he, he actually lived that. He actually practiced that. There was one instance where, uh, again, with the uh, controversy that he was involved in where his grandfather Solomon Stoddard, who was the pastor of the church before he pastored it, had taught the people who were there that even unconverted people needed to come to the Lord's table in the hopes that they might get grace and they might be converted. Jonathan Edwards did not agree with that. He knew he had to come out against that, and it was his duty to tell his people the truth. And so he told the truth, and he says, the handwriting on the wall looks like they're going to kick me out of this church if I do that. 
but I need to do this because this is my duty. And so he asked his friends to pray for him, and so he did it, and they did kick him out of the church. But the Lord had other plans for him. He provided a place for him in a, um, a mission station in Stockbridge, and that's where he was able to write some of his greatest works, which we have today, which we, humanly speaking, wouldn't have if he had stayed in the Northampton church. We need to be able to get past our fears and trust the Lord if we're going to do what he calls us to do. Now, Jesus concludes with an exhortation to faith based on an ironclad guarantee that the Father will provide for us, at least he will, if we put his concerns first. He says in verses 31 and 32, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. These are the things the Gentiles or the unbelievers, those outside of God's covenant in those days, that would be the Gentiles, that's what they're concerned about. Unbelievers worry day to day about these things, which is why they're trying to gather up everything they can from the world. But Jesus says we don't need to worry. The Father knows what we need, and he will take care of us. But Jesus says if we put his priorities first. Now, again, we're not talking about works here. We're talking about something that Jesus has actually given us the ability to do by his Holy Spirit. This is the direction the Spirit is going to be leading us. We need to yield to him. He wants us to put the kingdom first. Jesus says in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Again, think about how this fits with the Lord's prayer, uh, the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He says, first of all, pray in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray, first of all, for the growth of the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then he teaches them to pray, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who, have, uh, who, were, in, uh, who were indebted to us um, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil and so forth. So seek first the kingdom. And then seek for your needs. Jesus says, put the kingdom first. Put the kingdom first in our lives. If we do that, he says, he will meet those needs. He will give to us day by day what we need, just like the birds. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us we don't even have to worry about tomorrow, about what each new day is going to bring and whether or not there's going to be what we need in that particular day. He wants us to focus on the present, on doing his will today, seeking his kingdom today. Again, if we're engrossed in worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, we're not going to be able to focus on today. We're going to be focused on tomorrow and what we need to do to take care of tomorrow. The Lord says he's going to take care of tomorrow and all the tomorrows so we can focus on today. And so Jesus concludes with this. He says in verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It has enough to do. There's enough work in, in, in this day. So, you know, not to worry about tomorrow. And again, so the Lord says, focus on today, on what he calls us to do in seeking the kingdom, and know that the Lord is going to provide for the things you need for all your tomorrows. Well, may the Lord give us the grace, really, to believe this and, and to trust the Lord that he will do this for us so that we can devote ourselves to serving him today. Well, let, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do that.